and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about Lightroom, Photoshop, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm your host, Sean Duggan, and on this week's show, my guest is photographer, author, and photo educator, Colin Smith, and we're going to be talking about quadcopters and drones with a focus on creating and processing aerial panoramas. Stay with us. Well, my guest this week is Colin Smith, a best-selling author and award-winning digital artist who's been active in the field of Photoshop and digital photography education for many, many years. Colin, great to have you here. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Sean. Nice to see you. And so, uh, what have you been up to lately? Oh, I've just been uh, having fun. i uh, been bitten by the drone bug so i've been out flying drones for about the last three years so i usually disappear around sunset and i'm at the beach flying uh, except for today it's raining so believe it or not it's raining in southern california yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you, you guys need it and we, you know up in northern california we've gotten a lot more rain i know than than you guys have um so any rain is good yeah, no, I'm really happy for the rain. Of course, it would rain the day that I'm scheduled to be filming. So you got involved with uh, quadcopters and, and, and drones uh, pretty early on. Uh, from my, my, my recollection of that, you were kind of like on right on the bleeding edge there. Yeah, there was a small group of us, actually. Um, uh, Russell Brown was the one that roped me into this. Uh, I say roped me in, um, you know, it's become an addiction now, but there was a small group <laughs> of us who were at that time. There was Russell, there was, uh, Romeo, Mark, uh, Mike Johnson, uh, Barry Blanchard, um, Jeff Foster. Um, so we were kind of like some of the first people doing it. And that's when the Phantom one was around. Um, they barely had a gimbal at that point. It was a GoPro. There was no FPV. You were flying blind, just, seeing whatever, you know, you would see. Um, yeah. So it was very, very early on. And, uh, the reason Russell got me into that is we did the first ever drone workshop actually at Photoshop world. So he called me up and I said, was, Hey, oh. yeah, I, I was at that workshop. That was, that oh. was my, that, that was, that was sort of my first hands-on experience, uh, flying them. And, and actually one of my, my only hands-on experience I've actually, you know, uh, went out, I, I visited Jeff Foster once and flew a little bit with him, although it was totally under adult supervision. You know, I wasn't really doing much. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I think Jeff was actually into this about a month before uh, some of us. So um, it was funny because when Russell called me, you know, and he did the Russell Brown voice, you know, hi, this is Russell Brown from Adobe. And um, <laughs> I'd like you to consider doing a drone workshop with me and I'd like you to uh, teach video. And I'm like, um, okay, Russell, I'd love to do that, but I've never seen a drone. And so you know, he was like, well, you know, get a drone. Um, and so I, of course I contacted Jeff and he put me in contact with someone at DJI. I still had to pay. They didn't give me my first drone for free. Um, but that, you know, they gave me a little bit of a discount. Russell sent me a GoPro and then he flew me up um, to San Jose the next day. Um, so we could customize it. So we went to radio shack and we got a potentiometer so I could tilt the, um, uh. the thing. And he's like, uh, you know, of course I'm at the airport and I, you know, in San Francisco, oh, actually in San Jose, sorry. And I get a, text from Russell. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you were coming. Um, <laughs> can you get Adobe, you know, where the cafeteria is? I'm like, yeah. So yeah, I went there and got some breakfast and then he showed up. Then we went to radio shack and then we hit it over to Mark's place and, uh, and, you know, started chopping up my brand new controller, <laughs> putting, uh, potentiometers and gadgets. And I mean, that's how do it yourself. It was back then. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. And of course, after all that work, I, took it down to the beach. I had this beautiful case and everything and was flying at uh, San Clemente and filming some surfers and dropped it into the ocean. So, you know, I felt <laughs> really good hitting back, you know, with this plastic box and everything with no drone in it. <laughs> I, rem I remember when that happened because I remember you posting about that and, and, and you were hoping to maybe see if it would wash up at, uh, on the beach or something, but I, you never got it, right? No, I hung out, had a beer, you know, across the street, drowned my sorrows and then came back and it still hadn't washed up. There was a 
surfer. It was a kid surfing and I was like, Hey kid, you know, I got a drone here. If you can find it, I'll give you 50 bucks. And you know, and he couldn't find it. Uh, it was, the yeah. water was too murky and it was gone. So yeah, that was the end of the first one, you know, and I was really dreading calling Russell and saying, you know, I know you want me to teach this workshop, um, but I haven't recorded any of my videos yet. Cause I'm still trying to get the hang of this thing. And my videos are actually at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so, you know, eventually I had the courage to call Russell and tell him and, um, and he managed to, um, uh, acquire me another GoPro and I contacted my contact at the DJI and I was able to get another drone and, um, and then that's it. I haven't lost one since. So from, from what I've heard from, from talking to people who, who have them, that is a, a, a kind of a pivotal milestone moment when you are getting used to flying your drones or your quadcopters is the time when you finally feel confident to take it out over the water. <laughs> um, I don't know that I ever felt at that time confident about taking it over the water, but I just had to because yeah. where, where I live, um, you know, in Southern California and Irvine, there's nothing to shoot that's really interesting unless you're over the water. I mean, we've got beautiful coast here, which, you know, I absolutely love, but inland is tremendously boring. So there's nothing to shoot unless you are at the water. So I kind of got there and I was okay. I mean, I was quite comfortable on the controls, but what happened and which is what happens a lot to the beginners is when something goes wrong, um, like I was following a surfer and then I started to head towards the pier and then I panicked. And then, so when you panic, you usually do the wrong thing. So instead of pulling away, I flew into the pier. Um, uh, I just, my brain just shut off, just went into panic mode. And so after that, I realized, you know, there was a lot of maneuvers I needed to practice. And one of the maneuvers I practiced was a, uh, an emergency stop, you know, for when, you know, now with the new drugs, you just take your hands off and it just stops right there. I mean, but back then, you know, they kind of drifted a little bit. They weren't as good. So what I did is, you know, when you do the thing, when you're skating and you kind of spin around, so I would do the same thing is just yord around and then just flip around 180 degrees and that would stop it, you know, without ah. it drifting. So, um, so when I got in a panic like that, you know, I just would practice this, you know, stop maneuver. And I, you know, it's kind of good to practice, some maneuvers like that at the beginning when you're, when you're uncomfortable. So if your brain switches off, then you just do that thing that you know that you can do and hover until you get your wits about you again. Right, right, right. Well, so, um, and let's kind of, kind of move on because for, from, from, uh, getting into that early on and, and learning how to do that and, and starting to teach people, you uh, now have, um, some video training projects on, aerial digital photography using drones. So tell us a little bit about uh, some of that. Yeah, I'm actually um, just finished my second one, working on my third one right now. So obviously I'm a lot more comfortable. I have 12 drones right now. <laughs> uh, I hate to admit it. They're, they're taking over my house. They're just everywhere. Drones and boxes and propellers all over my house and my garage and everywhere. Um, but yeah, so a couple of years back, I did the DJI Phantom aerial video photography handbook. And I wanted to grab every search term there was in the title. <laughs> and it was a comprehensive nine hour training. Um, and that was on the Phantom two essentially. And then I just recently finished the Phantom three and inspire one versions, uh, which is also another nine hours, but I really upped the production value of that. Obviously know a lot more now than I knew back then. Um, right. Went to Hawaii, shot a lot of that on location. But, um, a big part of what I focus on, you know, is I do the stuff in the studio, you know, where I'm showing the gear and how to calibrate it. A lot of people don't know about calibrating and when to calibrate the IMUs and the gimbals and stuff like that. So sometimes it gets tilted and weird because things are not properly calibrated or the firmware is not done. So, you know, I talk about all of that, but the part that I really focus on is the actual flying for photography and flying for video because, you know, just going out there and flying is one thing, but if you want to get beautiful photographs, um, you have to fly, you know, a certain way to do that. You know, there's a certain altitude where things look good. Um, there's a three dimensional composition is what I call it because with a regular camera, you're composing in a 2d space, you're composing on the Z and the X axis, you know, the X axis is across and the Z is towards you or away from uh -huh. people. They're not familiar with that. And, and that's normal photography. Photography as we have known it is two dimensional. 
Right. But when you have a drone, it's now become three dimensional. I mean, when I say two dimensional, it's slightly three dimensional. Like, you know, we like one of the things we teach, you know, photography is get our different viewpoints. We lie down on our stomach or stand on a chair that, you know, and that can dramatically change the photographs. Now imagine if you were able to go 400 feet up in the air, how much more of an impact that can have when you realize just crouching down can make that big a difference with your photography. Right. So essentially for me, it's not so much about the gear or the equipment. Uh, it's not so much about the technology, even though, you know, I love the technology and trust me, I'm, I'm really hooked on that. It's fun. But for <laughs> me, it's about having a tripod that is flying. So basically compositional limits are gone. Like, when you go to the edge of a cliff or whatever, you know, you'll reach out there, you'll be hanging off that cliff for life and limb, hoping gust of wind doesn't come and blow you off with normal photography. You go as far as that tripod will take you, but now that tripod can go beyond the edge of that cliff. Um, so it's yeah. not always about being a million miles up in the air. It's, it's about being able to go any angle. So, you know, you see a subject like a traditional photographer, landscape photographer. I like to do a lot of oceanscapes. I'm limited to one direction. So there's some day, you know, uh, there's certain places I'll shoot in a sunset and certain places I'll shoot a sunrise because the light's hitting there. I can't move around, but with the drone, I can approach any angle so I can shoot any object at any time of the day and I can just fly around and get the right angle. So the light's right on it. And that's, exactly yeah, you know, that's, the, yeah. And then that's really been some of the, um, the, the aspects of, uh, of this kind of new, uh, type of photography that is now available to, you know, uh, the mass consumer, uh, that's really been the most fascinating is that that ability to find these, uh, these new vantage points, these new perspectives that were, you know, heretofore only available if you were up in an airplane or a helicopter or, you know, maybe a balloon or something like that, but just being able to easily go out there and find these compositions, like looking straight down, finding, you know, real kind of graphic, you know, almost geometric compositions from the air. That's really been interesting to see how other photographers have really kind of explored that and kind of uh, taken that concept and run with it. Yeah, that's definitely, um, you know, when you first get into it, that's something that really strikes you is, wow, you know, in the past I had to rent a helicopter, you know, for a thousand dollars an hour or whatever it would cost to be able to get these shots that I can now just go and do out of my backyard. Um, that's one part right. of it. And, um, and that's kind of like the original, you know, the initial fascination, should I say? And honestly, the, you know, being able to shoot from 400 feet up in the air is very much like your first HDR image. Um, you're amazed mm -hmm. that you can bring out this detail. Um, and it has this novelty factor, but what makes it even better is the fact that I can fly in places that you couldn't fly in a helicopter. A helicopter can't True. fly 50 feet off the ground. A helicopter can't fly between, um, you know, different obstacles. It can't fly, you know, sometimes I'm flying 10 feet. Sometimes I'm flying 50 feet or a hundred feet, but a helicopter is not supposed to go lower than 500 feet. Um, you know, civil, civil airspace without special regulations and permits and stuff like that. So I couldn't just rent a helicopter and go out and then sit somewhere at 200 feet and start photographing. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. They're very small and nimble and can go, uh, many places. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's fun. So, so you, you mentioned the concept of, of uh, a tripod in the sky earlier. Uh, so, Obviously, uh, in traditional photography, land-based photography, we use a tripod to stabilize our camera. Um, and in terms of stabilization, how is that these days with when you were up there, let's say, making an aerial panorama? So what, what is, what's your kind of flying workflow for shooting a panorama? And then later on, we'll kind of get into a post-processing uh, look on that. All right. So currently right now I'm flying the newest technology, which is the uh, Phantom four. And it was just came out a couple of weeks ago. I got one of the first ones. I was very fortunate. Um, and also I fly the inspire one uh, with the X five 
Um, so the reason I, I bring these up is because the technology has really come a long way from the early days, you know, cause these use satellite for stabilization and it's always been pretty good, but right now it's unbelievable because it uses two satellite networks. It uses uh, GLONASS, which is Russian satellite system, and it uses GPS, which is the American satellite system. So it's not unusual for me to be locked onto 22 to 24 satellites for positioning. And that will hold that thing rock solid. Literally, you can take an eight second exposure there in the sky without it moving. Um, so, eight? you know, they are, that, yeah. That, wow. These things That's are amazing. Very stable. Eight seconds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. And, and what if it's, uh, what if it's breezy? It's still I'm it's probably not going to do that. No. Uh, if it gets <laughs> okay. a little windy or a little breezy, it, it, it does tend to you know bounce around a little bit. Um, but what it does is it uses the um, satellites to fight against the wind. So it sees its position. If it, the wind does blow, it will fight against the wind to hold its, its position. So if a little bit of a breeze, it's actually okay. But you, know, you start getting 10 to 20 mile an hour gusts, it gets a little harder. But having said that, for shooting an aerial panorama, it doesn't matter because you're so far away from your subject. You know, it's like yeah. you don't have to worry about, you know, parallax and all that kind of stuff, you know, when, you know, cause sometimes I'm shooting a panorama, I might not be that high up in the air. I might be a couple of hundred feet or a hundred feet, 150 feet up, but sometimes I'm a thousand feet out. So it doesn't really matter if this was to move even a foot or two, it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. 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 The software is so good at, at stitching them together. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and so when you, when you have the, the drone up there, uh, obviously these days it, you have a controller where you can actually see what the, what the camera is seeing, uh-huh. uh, which is a huge improvement over the early days where you just kind of had to guess. But uh, so w- what's your workflow uh, when you uh, f- find a scene that you want to shoot a panorama? Talk us through that. Okay. So um, when I find a scene, what I do is I look for, okay, what do I want to be the central point? Because as you know, when we do panorama, especially with smaller lenses, you get, you know, things like the shapes are going to be kind of weird and distorted, which, which can actually be kind of cool. Um, so what, what you want to do is find a center point. What is the real thing? What, what's the most important thing of here and make that your center. But, don't make it your center by pointing at it. So say, for example, if there's a coastline that goes across, like, you know, here's the coastline. And let me see if you can see that. And then my center point is here. Don't sit here and tilt towards it. Fly over it so you're pointing. And that's the other advantage of a drone. You can fly wherever you want. And so center your camera on where, what you want to be the center of that photograph. And then when I've done that, um, then what I do is I'll just pan around and just take one photograph at a time. Sometimes I'll take a bracketed shots. So what I'll do is I'll center it, but then I'll move it around to, um, and and if there's a sunset, usually the sunset's on this side where I am. So I'll go this side, I'll start here, and then I'll take a photograph, and then I'll take overlap. But the overlap is not necessarily 30% or whatever we do, you know, I'll probably do more of an overlap, probably closer to a 50% overlap, just because when you warp these, um, Mm -hmm. you you tend to get um, a lot less, you know, there's, there's a lot more wastage around the edge. Let's just say it that way. So, so you'll do it like a 30 to 50%. And what I'm really doing though is when I'm doing it is I'm looking for key um, features in the landscape that I want to be centered in each shot. Um, yeah. so, so I'm just kind of going around. And then what I'll do is when I get the last one on, which is usually on this side for the sunset, then I'll uh, hit the exposure lock and then go around so the exposure doesn't dramatically change for that last shot. Um, mm-hmm. But other times you do a multi-layered panorama. So if I'm doing a multi-layered panorama, which means I'll shoot one where I'm looking up and getting some of the sky, one for the middle, and then another one for the bottom, I'll use the grid on the screen. So on your screen, you've got a rule of thirds grid that you can turn on. And I use that rule of thirds grid and I literally just look at it and then I'll move one and I'll just move to the next grid line. And so I'll use it mm-hmm. like a site and then same with the baseline oh, yeah. and in the top. So then that way I can line it up. And so maybe I'll take, you know, um, maybe 15, maybe five up, five cross and then five down, you know, for that, then I'll line them up. However, if you don't line them up, perfectly. It doesn't matter. Lightroom can fix it. But the problem is if you get one where you left a little hole in there, then either you got to crop that out and you're going to lose a lot of your panorama 
or when you stretch it out, it can get like a little wavy looking. Right. Right. So, so the, uh, the moral of the story there is, is it's better to have the extra coverage than to not have it. So e even if you end up cropping off a lot of that, it's much better to have that detail. Captured. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the time, you know, I'll crop, a, I'll crop away maybe a quarter of my panoramas because I, I overshoot. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. So are we, is there, when you're shooting them, are you, do you shoot that center shot first, then go out and shoot the sides or do you pretty much shoot from one direction over to the other direction? You could do either. Um, I'll be honest. Most of the time I, when I go out, I usually start with the center and I'll work my way across. Um, mm -hmm. But if I'm doing a multi-layered panorama, I won't. If I'm doing a multi-layered panorama, I'll start from one side and then work my way across like, you know, figure of S kind of thing. Mowing the lawn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And, um, and are these raw exposures that you're able to get out of the newer cameras on the drone that you're using? Oh yeah. Yeah. Actually they've had raw for quite a while, um, since the vision, uh, which was about two years ago. So the, the vision, the vision plus, um, the phantom three and the phantom four and the inspire all shoot DNG raw. In fact, it was the first camera. Um, the phantom vision was like this little round camera. It was horrible, but you know, at the time it was <laughs> groundbreaking and it was so funny cause it was only a couple of years ago, but it feels like, you know, the Egyptians Ages had it ago. like in the, in the Pharaoh's tomb <laughs> or something, you know, it feels so primitive now, <laughs> but they were the, that was the first camera ever to shoot, um, natively in DNG. So, so, you know, what you just said there, that little kind of quip about the Egyptians and the Pharaoh's tomb <laughs> is that now, now, you know, we need to come up with these old, old ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic drawings showing an ancient Egyptian flying a drone. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the cover for your next, uh, your next tutorial there project. Yeah, there you go. Cleopatra flying in with these drones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. I know the lost history of drones. Well, listen, let's, let's dive into uh, taking a look at how you, uh, you would put one of these together uh, in, um, on the computer. All right. Okay. All right. So here I am. I'm in Lightroom right now, and this is my preferred tool of choice. I, and once again, speaking of the Egyptians a few years ago, I never <laughs> would have thought that I would be doing everything in Lightroom. Um, and I'm actually trying to get a lot of aerial photographers into Lightroom because it's just such a perfect tool for this. Um, I do also use Photoshop. Um, but anyway, so here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you just a basic panorama. This is just a five image panorama. This is Newport Harbor here. And why don't I zoom in a little bit so you can see the shots I've got here. So speaking of order, this order is all over the place. Um, but this is how I shot it. So this is the harbor entrance here. And we're kind of going in here and I'm just shooting that Harbor there. So it's just, it's not necessarily the whole scene. I do have more complicated ones, but I don't want to do those. Um, so these are just right now, I've just saved them as JPEGs, but this is more just for the sake of processing speed. Cause I'm on my a very old laptop right now. So I'm just going to select these um, one, two, three, four, five. So I've got five of those and it's just so easy to do this in Lightroom. Just right click. And then we're going to go to photo merge and then we're just going to choose a panorama. So let me, uh, let me just jump in here with a, a quick question before you get into that. Um, are you applying, uh, any, any adjustments ahead of time to, before you go into panorama, are you doing like lens correction, uh, profiles or, or anything else to the shots? Um, that's, that's a great question. In the past, we used to have to do that, especially with the GoPros. Um, we would apply all the profiles and everything like that first before we would do anything. Otherwise it would just fail. There's just no way it would, uh, it would even stitch. So, um, with, since the Phantom three and the Phantom four, they really reduced the amount of lens distortion. So it's not shooting with that fisheye effect anymore. So you don't really need to. Um, and also they don't have a Phantom four profile in, um, in Lightroom yet. Um, so I could have applied a Phantom three profile to this if I'd wanted. Um, but yeah. it, at this point it's not really necessary. It used to be necessary, but, but not anymore. Right. Right. And you know, you're, you're right that the, 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 uh, the current stitching technology in Lightroom is really, uh, quite impressive. It is, it is. And I'm not sure, um, maybe you might know this. I'm not sure if when you go into the panorama, it automatically applies a camera profile. 
Yeah, I, th that I'm not sure of either. That was going to be one of my other questions. Um, I, I would think maybe it doesn't because that is a sort of a, a choice that you uh, are given the option to apply uh, in the normal editing uh, suite in, in Lightroom. Although, you know, I, I could be mistaken. I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to have to look into that. I'm going to get I'm going to guess it probably doesn't. Um, and but as you can see here, you know, see how it's not stitched yet. This is just a preview right now. But as you can see, I was able to do that really nicely without having to apply any profiles. Um, you know, I know in the past, if I tried to do that from a GoPro, it would just, it would just fail. Or I'd have all yeah. kinds of weird things. Um, so, you know, maybe, yeah. So it seems, seems to work quite well, but this is the latest version of Lightroom. I just did the update. Um, I think it was like last week it came out. So you'll notice you don't have the auto option on here anymore, which was redundant because the auto option would always pick the same one. So it didn't really do anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. I pretty much always use spherical spherical, but if you look at cylindrical, it'll, it'll give me a little bit more, um, should give me a little more height in this. Yeah, there we go. So it kind of stretches yeah. out, gives you a little more height. Um, but I feel like it stretches the stuff in here a little. It looks a little unnatural. So I like to use a spherical option. Seems to work well for, for aerial work. See there, just that proportions just seem a little more natural. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, there's two options here. The one we always had uh, was auto crop. And that auto crop just kind of hides those edges around there. And we used to go cylindrical and spherical and play around with that to try and you know, see where we could recover most of it. But now we've got this awesome thing called boundary warp and boundary warp. I can just pull this over and literally as I do that, I can recover more of the picture. And sometimes I'll just pull it all the way to the end and see how it looks. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of curvature there. Just tell her I'm so high as a curvature of the earth. I'm, I'm kidding. And, um, and, and, <laughs> and, and then the, the other thing that, that I always uh, am on the lookout for with boundary warp is that, uh, you know, when you have an image that has a lot of sort of high frequency detail information in it, such as you do here with with the, the structures and the houses, especially over on the right side of the image, um, is there a potential for boundary warp to introduce distortion into areas of of uh, detail like that? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it happens, but once again, that's another reason to overshoot and just kind of crop that out later. Um, right. But yeah, sometimes it can, and sometimes I won't use boundary warp. Um, you know, like in a situation like this, if I was to crop it, so I'm going to lose a lot of that building there. So what I'll yeah. do sometimes I'll put it into auto crop and then just pull out boundary warp until I see the features I want, like maybe there I've got these uh, features here and then I can say, Hey, you know what? That that's good. So you don't always have to push it all the way to the end, but what it does right, is just right. recovers more detail. And this is kind of an alternative. The other way we could do it, you know, that, that I still do sometimes is I'll go like, you know, maybe just like this and then bring it into Photoshop and just use content aware fill to just kind of fill up those edges. That's another way of doing it. If you get a little bit worried about it, but I'm finding mm -hmm. the boundary warps working really quite well, like maybe this much and I've got a, you know, pretty good shot and it, it saves a ton of time. And once again, I haven't merged it yet. I haven't committed to anything. Um, so that's what I love about this, you know, for people like me, you know, I, I have commitment issues. So <laughs> I, it's wonderful because nothing is destructive and nothing is committed. Um, but the thing, you know, in the past you would have to go into Photoshop and I know some aerial photographers are still doing that. And then you got to wait, you know, quite a while. Sometimes you stitch these together and decide whether or not you even like it. You don't even know sometimes. So here you can get a quick preview and say, you know what, these images are going to work or these are not, you know, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you shut a pano and it's just, it's just not going to work. And you literally have to go out and shoot it again. I'm, you know, fortunately that doesn't happen very often now because I kind of been doing it a while and I know what I want, but I know that when I first started shooting aerial panoramas, at least half of them failed. They were just, they were just worthless. So it takes a little bit of practice um, to kind of get a feel for it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but then once you've done that and you hit the merge button, then it's going to um, start to merge these together. You can see up here. And the cool thing about it too, is if I hit um, control shift uh, M, I can actually be merging multiple panoramas at the same time in the background. If I hit command shift M, I just select them and then do that. I don't even have to see that preview. It'll take the last settings and apply it. 
Um, oh, that's doing. very useful. That's very yeah. useful. Yeah, and I do that a lot when I'm doing HDR panels. So I'll, I'll merge all my, I'll just hit Control Shift H, merge all my um, HDRs together first in the background, and then I'll come and stitch them together just like I did here in the panels. But as you and see so here, the, yeah. Well, I just gonna, just a quick question with that shortcut you just mentioned about essentially you know selecting the other images and applying the the previously used merge to panorama settings to, to those new selections or to those new images. It's using all of the panorama settings, including the, any boundary warp setting you may have applied? That's a good question. Let's find out. So I'm just going to hit the shift key and go there and then hit the M. Hang on. Control ah, shift M. There we go. I don't know why all these, I got these windows opening, but it's, it's working there. Oh, I went into develop mode. That's why. So it's stitching another panorama in the background and let's compare them. Um, the, the only sure reason I would uh, be curious about that, yeah, is that obviously the boundary warp settings for one image might not necessarily be suitable for another image. True. Um, and looking at these, let's zoom in on them. They look pretty similar to me. Actually, let me just hit my tab key. And uh, let's do the compare view. Is that the two of you? Uh, compare view should do that. Yeah. Um, that's looking pretty the same to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. If I look at that house in the corner, that's kind of a good. Uh, yeah. Gauge. So it looks like it does um, do those, those boundary warp settings. Um, so, you know, yeah. That's, oh, that's great. Cool. That's a, so, so what's that again? A control shift M uh, and shift M. Uh, control shift M for merge, uh, for, and control shift H for HDR. Okay. And that would be, of course, that's, uh, the control shift M would be on the, the PC end and then command shift M on the Mac end. No, it's actually the control on the Mac. So oh, okay. I have no idea what that is on windows, probably control as well. I haven't used windows in a long time. Interesting. Okay. So, um, yeah, and so, so this is now a, a DNG file that has been created, correct? Yes, it is. It's a DNG file, which is great because it's small. Um, and also the whole latitude is in there. So if I was working with, uh, with HDR, the full dynamic range would still be in there, um, or even not working on HDR in this case, the full rawness of the DNG is still there. So it's not, you know, dropping it down to an 8-bit JPEG or anything like that. Yeah, no that 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 is a great uh, a great tool, especially I imagine if you're if you're shooting or if you're going to be processing an image such as you have here, where there is a a fairly broad dynamic range. You've got the highlights from the sunset over in the upper left, and the the deeper shadows kind of in the foreground on the harbor, and you have a lot more flexibility, I think, to bring those out uh, with a DNG file. Yeah, well, you know, if you have a look at it here, let me show you. You know, if we hit the highlight recovery, I usually push all the way up. In this case, maybe not because it makes it look too smuggy, but, um, yeah. but I can, you, you can always counter out the, the whites. Uh, well, and so, then you got the dehaze de slider for the smog, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I gotta be honest. I don't use the dehaze much because it tends to darken things down a lot. Um, so, I mean, if something was like really, um, you know, faded and I, I felt like mm -hmm. I really had to do it, I would, but here's the thing with the dehaze here. Um, is I just feel like, watch this. See how it really darkens the image? Yeah, it definitely uh, gives it a, a, quite a contrast hit and also sometimes a, a saturation hit too. Uh, when I use it on some images, I find myself kind of going back and selectively desaturating areas that have gotten a little bit too punchy. Yeah, so I'll be honest with you. The stuff I like to use is, you know, typically I'll set my exposure. Um, I'll recover my highlights. I'll open up my shadows and then I don't do much with contrast because contrast is just blacks and whites and I prefer to do them independently. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I grab my whites here, I grab my blacks and I'll set those. And then, you know, if you look at that, you know, from before and after just basically these are just yeah. simple moves, you know, I usually do some kind of color correction, but even clarity, I'm a little iffy about, I used to love clarity, you know, but. I don't know. I don't I think I like clarity anymore. <laughs> well, it, it, it's just one of those things where it's, it is easy to overdo it. And so uh, I think a little bit of clarity is, is oftentimes good, but you really have to kind of apply it with a, 
a light touch and a, a discerning eye because it really is easy to go overboard on clarity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think part of it too is, you know, our own tastes change. It's just like, you know, um, when I was doing a lot more graphic design, you know, I'd have a certain font that I used all the time in certain colors. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly I'd get sick of that font and then it was another font. So, you know, having said that right now, I'm not into clarity, but you know, next week I might be you know, a hundred percent clarity. Who knows? You know. <laughs> well, the, the other thing too, is like, you know, when, when HDR kind of first uh, came on the scene, you know, all of our you know earlier HDR shots are probably a lot more you know over the top than maybe our HDR shots nowadays. You know where we're a little bit more uh, subtle in how we're using it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I know I was definitely guilty of that. But you know, when I say I was guilty, I never like was into the halos and the oversaturated colors and that foggy yeah. look. Um, you know. I know that I was very much into very illustrative looking, um, HDRs and I, and I still enjoy those for certain things, but yeah, there's, there's a fine line between a style and a mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, a lot of that, uh, and, and I guess this really applies to, to HDR, but, but also for, for, for any sort of processing tool or, or new feature that shows up in, in a software program or a plugin or whatever, you know, a, a lot of it is just sort of like figuring out what you can do with this new creative tool and, and how you can push it. And, and I like to tell people in my classes and workshops and, and training is that, you know, you never know what's too far until you've gone too far. <laughs> you that's, know? That's and, and then when, when you go too far, you will recognize, oh, I've gone way too far on this. I need to back it off. But so, so just the act of going too far in, in software like that and image processing can be very instructional because it, it lets you identify kind of your own little kind of boundary points for what you feel is too far. Well, I think it's part of growth as well. Um, I, I find with myself when I do something new, I tend to overdo it at first and then I go the opposite extreme and then I underdo it. And it's so subtle yeah. that, you know, people don't even know it's there. And I kind of have a balance. I'll be honest with you. I do a lot of processing, which is a little more heavy handed than what I'm comfortable with, but the audience seems to like it better. So, mm-hmm. um, so I, I actually do process mine a little heavier than, than what I would like, but, um, but you know, if I want to sell prints or, or whatever, I, you know, I've got to create what the people like. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sure. Yeah. You gotta uh, know what the, uh, know what the audience wants. And, uh, and uh work towards that that panorama turned out really nice i mean just those very simple adjustments and i think that, you know that's that's one thing that a lot of people maybe don't realize because especially if maybe they're new to lightroom you know it's easy to get overwhelmed by the the uh array of all these different sliders and panels in lightroom but um for many images you really don't have to do very much like you've only really worked in the basic tab here yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but sometimes I do like to go in and do some things with the colors too. Um, but in this case, you know, it depends on the image. Like sometimes I like to go into the selective color and push the, um, I might push the, the greens or the oranges. I like to sometimes push the oranges a little bit towards the yellow, just slightly. It just makes sunsets look warmer and nicer. Um, and sometimes I'll push a little saturation into the greens um, and also I might do the, um, uh, the luminosity in the greens. I might actually open up a little bit and lighten it up a little bit. So if there's some grass yeah. and stuff there, it tends to make it look a little better because sometimes this, these cameras, not as bad as they used to, but they used to definitely do a little bit of an orange color cast and mm-hmm. a certain degree is a little bit of it in there still. Um, but also, you know, we've got the sunset, we've got that. Thing. So I like to push it a little more into the yellows and a little less into the oranges sometimes. All right, cool. Excellent. All right. Well, that was definitely a useful demo. Uh, Colin, thanks for that. Makes me kind of want to, you know, every time I talk to my friends and, and colleagues who have drones and quadcopters, it always sort of reignites that little bit of interest, like, oh, maybe I should get into that. But I haven't gotten into it yet. Like I said, I've only flown under adult supervision with Russell Brown and uh, <laughs> Jeff Foster. So uh, one of these days, maybe uh, I'll get into it. But I know every time I talk to somebody who's showing me their their aerial work, it always kind of uh, 
ratchets my interest up another few levels. Absolutely. Uh, I hear that uh, from a lot of people. Um, you know, you start sharing these on social media and people are like, man, I want to do that. I want to do that. And I tell people, you know, be warned, you know, it's an addiction because you don't have one drone. You better have a spare <laughs> room in your house because there'll be all kinds of things before, you know, there's boxes and yeah, you know, and, and, the, and, and, the GPC cases and all, you know, and then you're going to get filters and then you're going to get, you know, all, all the stuff that goes with it. And one drone is never enough. <laughs> One drone is never enough. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, uh, probably in the learning phase, there's always at least going to be one major crash. Like yeah, Absolutely. Had. I tell people that consider your first drone gone. And, and I did that my very first. And it, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> but, uh, but literally, you know, consider that first one gone that you've already lost it and just go out there, fly it you know, safely, but, you know, push it, find out what you can do, find out its limits. And then once you've crashed it, you know, then baby your next one. <laughs> right. Right. Cool. Well, Colin, where can people find out uh, more about you and, and your tutorials on the web? All right. So um, I have a couple of places, you know, if people want to see my images, um, I share a drone image every single day to Instagram and, uh, and also Facebook, which is Photoshop cafe. Um, but all my stuff really lives at photoshopcafe.com and I have a bunch of tutorials there. I have two types of tutorials. I have free tutorials where I have hundreds of free tutorials. Actually, uh, I have a whole section on drones uh, where I'm showing you how to do everything from shooting videos, turning those into panoramas and the whole deal. Um, and then also I have a premium tutorials, which I've been doing for a long time. And those are the more comprehensive, you know, nine, 10, 13 hour ones. And I have one of course on the drones here where I really spend, you know, here I just scrape the, the very surface of what, what I do. Um, and so I really spend a lot of time going into the processing of, uh, photographs and also videos and premiere pro. Uh, but also spend a lot of time in Photoshop with these, um, you know, so I kind of showed you the basic one, but then when I take it into Photoshop and then do some other things and start dodging and burning, I mean, this thing will just pop off the pages really gives it a nice look. Um, so all of that's available at uh, photoshopcafe.com. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, I seem to recall the last time I was at the Rocky Nook website that you have a book in the works for them. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Really. I'm actually super excited about it. Um, you know, and I'm not actually just saying that because uh, you've written books, you know, it's, you give up, you know, a, a third of your brain cells and a third of your life when you're writing a book. <laughs> um, and, but honestly, I've never been so excited about a book just because the guys at Rocky Nook get it. They really understand, um, quality and they really helping me create the best book possible and, and really care about that. So yeah, that's going to be available in September. Um, it's going to be a beautiful book. It's going to be wide. Um, you know, cause that was the other thing, you know, when they said, uh, did you want to write a book? I was like, well, here's my condition. Uh, all books generally are tall, but you can't shoot portraits on a drone. You only shoot landscape. So the book needs to be in a landscape format. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense. And, you know, and that's a right. lot more expensive to print. And, um, you know, some publishers would just say, no, we're not going to do that, but not the guys at Rocky Nook. They're like, yeah, let's do it. Great. Great. Well, apropos Rocky Nook, I need to mention that we currently have a book giveaway in process, uh, generously sponsored by Rocky Nook. And so this was, uh, introduced on last week's episode. That was episode, uh, 60, uh, where I talked about, uh, layer masking basics in Photoshop. So uh, if you're listening to this or watching this now, head to the page on thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. Go and find uh, episode 60, layer masking, basic layer masking in Photoshop. And there you'll find instructions for how to enter the book giveaway. There's a two week period. So the book giveaway is gonna close on Tuesday, April 19th. And since Colin's upcoming book is uh, a Rocky Nook book, you could potentially choose that. So basically the winner can choose uh, the book of their choice that's available on the Rocky Nook website. Now, obviously, since Colin's book is not out now, uh, you know, you would not be able to get the book until it does come out. But, you know, if you are a winner, we can arrange to get you that book when it does come out. So that's a cool deal. You should definitely take advantage of that because I'm sure it'll be a great book knowing the excellent work that Colin does. 
Well, thanks. And and if you do order the book and you can get it now, give it to me, and then I won't have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think that that something like that's going to require a TARDIS, and I don't have one of those handy right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right well excellent thanks so much for stopping by and talking to us about some of your aerial work colin i really enjoyed it and uh learned a lot and as i said my my interest is once again uh peaked in terms of uh getting into working with drones thanks you'll a lot. fall off the wagon you, i'll give you time <laughs> i'll see you at, at some event and you'll be like I'm, yeah I flew you, you'll, you'll see me i flew into the ocean i flew into a building or something like that <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I know. Yeah, because I have a cool river near where I live, and I was the shots of like, oh, going down the river. I know that it would happen one of these days. <laughs> well, I look forward to All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that happens, uh, or perhaps should I say when that happens, when I get my first drone and when I have my first catastrophic drone crash, I will come here and I'll tell you all about it on The Fix. All right, well, that wraps it up for uh, this week's show. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and joining me. I do appreciate that. And uh, hey, did you know that you can also subscribe to the audio version of The Fix on iTunes? Well, you can. Good to know. Of course, if you're more visually inclined, you can come to our website, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix to watch the video version. And there's also a, a downloadable audio version there if you uh, want to access that. And you can also go to YouTube to the This Week in Photo page and watch our show there. So many ways, so many choices for watching The Fix. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks very much for watching. Catch you next week on The Fix.